But what about origins? The dominant and virtually unchallenged myth of our origin is either that God created us in seven days along with all the rest of creation or that the universe was born out of nothingness in a single moment for no reason. These are the two choices on the menu. Neither terribly compelling to rationalists, I dare say. Interesting to note that this scientific explanation, the universe sprang from nothing in a single instant, however we may think of it in terms of its veracity, notice that it's the limit case for credulity. <laughs> if you can believe that, hell, you can believe anything. <laughs> Sit down and try and think of something more improbable than that contention. So it's like they open up with the one-two punch and say, you know, put that in front of them. If they can swallow that, then, you know, the hydrogen bond, gene segregation, segregation and whatever will follow hard to pace because the hard swallow comes first. If I can do smoke and mirrors in that, then the rest will proceed quite in an orderly fashion. If that now that's orthodoxy, you gotta understand. You know, that's what the straight people believe. It is, in fact, no different than saying, and God said, let there be light. And what the philosophers of science are saying is, give us one free miracle, and we will roll from that point forward, from the birth of time to the crack of doom, just one free miracle. And then it will all unravel according to natural law and these bizarre equations which nobody can understand but which are so holy in this enterprise. Doesn't it seem more likely, if we have to have a singularity, that it occurs in a domain with a rich history, with many causal streams feeding into the situation that nurtures the complexity. In other words, to put it simply, if you have to have a singularity, doesn't it make more sense to put it at the end of a cosmogonic process than at the beginning? And if that's true, then we represent a kind of concrescence of universal intent. We're not mere spectators or a cosmic accident or some sideshow or the Greek chorus to the main event. The human experience is the main event. The coordination of perception, of hope, of dream, of vision that occurs inside the human heart-mind-body interface is the most uh, complex phenomenon in the universe. And you don't have to be a rocket scientist to see that human society, human history, human art, human literature uh, represent things for which there is no analog in the world of wasps, groundhogs, uh, killer whales, and so forth and so on. Well, you would imagine, or I imagined when I first started thinking about this, that there must be some huge edifice of established theory that we have to go up in there and blow up. Surely somebody has has staked out this ground and made some kind of an argument about human consciousness. Well, in terms of science, not, or almost not. I mean, in terms of religion, it's simple. I mean, God made us from the clay of the earth. In terms of science, the best shot is pretty weak soup from my point of view. Here's, here's what science is telling us, that when you throw something, you have to plan. Because once you let go of whatever it is you're throwing, you can no longer control it. 
And so because we were small and weak and hunted in packs, we learned to throw like hell at very large onrushing woolly uh, fellow mammals of various sorts. And you had to plan your throw. Consequently, we developed brain capacity to do this and had enough left over to invent quantum physics, paint the Mona Lisa, invent the phonetic alphabet, philosophy, religion, and all the rest of it. Uh, in other words, it was the coordination of the hand and the eye to the throwing arm, this is what the orthodox folks tell us, that gave us this extra brain capacity that we sort of then managed into human civilization. Well, notice that this would make the pinnacle of the evolutionary ladder uh, the gum-chewing big league baseball pitcher. <laughs> Because, you know, he can put that pill right across the plate at high speed, uh, time after time. As somebody who learned everything they know about sadomasochism in PE class, uh, <laughs> I, I, I'm not really ready to embrace uh, this theory. I had a biologist tell me once, if genes aren't involved, it ain't evolution. So that means you can't talk about the evolution of the Earth as a physical body. You can't talk about the evolution of human social institutions. Evolution is somehow a word uh, appropriate to biology and appropriate nowhere else. And this brings me then to the first uh, factor easily discerned by anybody who has their eyes open that compromises and erodes the hopeless existential view of the world that we're getting from science. It's not a coincidence that electrons spinning around an atomic nucleus and planets going around a star and star clusters orbiting around the gravitational center of a galaxy. It's no coincidence that these uh, systems exhibit the same kind of order on different scales. And yet science would say that is a coincidence. You know, P.W. Bridgman, who was a philosopher of science, defined coincidence as what you have left over when you apply a bad theory. It means that, you know, you've overlooked something and what jumps out at you as a coincidence is actually a set of relationships whose, uh, whose causuistry, is sim whose relationships to each other are simply hidden from you. What I've observed is that nature builds on previously established levels of complexity. This is a great general natural law that your own senses will confirm for you, but that has never been allowed into the canon of science. And what I mean by that nature builds on complexity is the following. When the universe was born in the dubious and controversial circumstance called the Big Bang. It was at first simply a pure plasma of electrons. It was the simplest that it could possibly be. There were no atoms, there were no molecules, there were no highly organized systems of any kind. There was simply a pure plasma of expanding energy. And as the universe cooled, simply cooled, new kinds of phenomena, we say, emerged out of the situation. Uh, as the universe cooled, atomic nuclei could form and electrons could settle into stable orbits. As the universe further cooled, the chemical bond 
became a possibility. Still later, the hydrogen bond, which is a weaker bond, which is the basis of biology. So as the universe aged, it complexified. This is so obvious that it's never really been challenged. But on the other hand, it's never been uh, embraced as a general and dependable principle either. Follow it through with me. Out of atomic systems come chemical systems. Out of chemical systems comes the covalent hydrogen bond, the carbon bond, complex chemistry that is prebiotic or organic. Out of that chemistry come the macrophysical systems that we call membranes, gels, charge transfer complexes, this sort of thing. These systems are the chemical uh, uh, preconditions for life, simple life, the life of the prokaryotes, the life of naked, unnucleated DNA that characterized primitive life on the planet. Out of that life come eukaryotes, nucleated cells, and then complex colonies of cells, and then cell specialization, leading to higher animals, leading to social animals, leading to complex social systems, leading to technologies, leading to globe-girdling, electronically-based information transfer-oriented cultures like ourselves. Someone said, what, what's so progressive about media? It's the spreading of darkness at the speed of light. It, it can be. It can be. Well, so this is very interesting that apparently the way the universe works is upon a, com upon a platform of previously achieved complexity, chemical, electrical, social, biological, whatever, new forms of complexity can be built that cross these ontological boundaries. In other words, what I mean by that is that biology is based on complex chemistry, but it is more than complex chemistry. Social systems are based on the organization that is animal life, and yet it is more than animal life. So this is a general law of the universe overlooked by science, that out of complexity emerges greater complexity. We could almost say that the universe, nature, is a novelty-conserving or complexity-conserving engine. It makes complexity and it preserves it and it uses it as the basis for further complexity. You see, what science would have you believe and explicitly implies is that we are an aberration. Here over here you have nature, the beautiful rainforests, the wonderful coral reefs, the symmetry of the hummingbird, the sea urchin, and the butterfly. And here you have us, grimy, tawdry, polluting, ugly, driven, in equilibrium, in disequilibrium, in denial. I don't believe that. I believe that this kind of thinking that breaks humanity away from the rest of nature is the first of the great disempowering myths by which the Western mind has enslaved itself. And we are not outside of nature. We are not a runaway, toxic process. We are not a mutation. We are, in fact, that part of nature which has been deputized for a purpose. We are the energy gathering aspect of the Gaian mind. We are the language forming capacity of nature 
herself. You may know the concept of a catalyst in chemistry. A catalyst is something which, when you stir it into a chemical reaction, the reaction proceeds more quickly, but the catalyst itself is not destroyed. And this is what I think we are. We are a strategy on the part of the Gaian mind to produce an effect. That would otherwise take much, much longer to produce. The main effect of the presence of human life on this planet has been to vastly accelerate the speed at which nature is able to、uh, creatively express herself. So, being hopefully a sane person, my own inner dialogue. Uh, goes back and forth between the desire to preserve rationality and hence channel energy toward utopian hope, which is reasonable. After all, we have the money, the scientific knowledge, the、uh, communication systems, and so forth to solve any of our problems: feeding the hungry, curing disease, halting the destruction of the environment. The problem is our minds. That we cannot change our minds as quickly as we can redesign harbors, flatten mountains, cut rainforests, dam rivers. These things pose no problem. Changing our minds is very difficult. It's a very persistent idea in all times and all places. This highly unlikely concept has been kept alive. And I don't. I think that we are blinding ourselves to the intentionality present in our world.